Hello, ladies. Welcome to week five of Love This Book. My name is Melissa Tinsley, and I am so thankful that I get to come and slow down and just be with you today, even if it is virtually. Um, I'm just really excited to get to share with you all what God has been showing me. So last week, we looked at the life of Ruth, and today we're going to journey with her great-grandson, David, who God has established as a new king of Israel. When David is at his best, he is this beautiful picture of Christ, marked with meekness and humility, and he has this deep sense of trust that allows him to surrender his desires and wait on God's timing to bring things about how he chooses. David has a deep intimacy with God, and it fuels his desire to be in God's presence. However, even David, God's chosen and anointed king, even he wrestles and struggles when God acts in a way that is unfamiliar, when God acts in a way that David doesn't think is right. But it is this very difficult and painful experience that God uses to shape and change David's mindset and to shape and change David's character. And ultimately, it brings David to a deeper place of worship. And all of this, it lays the groundwork and the foundation for the promise that David is going to receive in chapter 7. So today, we are going to walk with David, and we are going to experience a range of emotions And what I hope to be able to show you is God's rescue story for mankind unfolding before us and how it takes us from a place of despair to a place of rejoicing to a future that is full of promise. So we are going to look at three aspects today. We are going to look at the problem, the provision, and the promise. So when we encounter David in chapter 6, we are meeting a very, very successful person. He has the backing of the 12 tribes of Israel. He um, is being recognized by foreign nations as their king. And he has captured and secured this well-fortified city of Jerusalem. And he has established it now as Israel's capital. And this did some amazing things for um, Jerusalem, for the Israelites. One, it gave them a new sense of um, identity, national identity. It gave them a new sense of unity. But even more so, it really elevated David in their eyes. They now saw David as truly God's anointed king and that God was with him. And so David, he doesn't want to just unite the people politically. He wants to unite the people spiritually under the God he loves. And nothing in the Old Testament is more connected with the power and the presence of Yahweh than the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant, just a little background here, it um, came, it was commissioned by God as part of the Mosaic Covenant. Now the Mosaic Covenant, that stemmed from the Abrahamic Covenant, the promise to Abraham that through his descendants, all of the world was going to be blessed. And so at the foot of Mount Sinai, God, he gathers together these people, his nation Israel, and he tells them that if they are able to obey the terms of this covenant, that they will be so shaped by God's rules and his laws and his teachings that they will become a kingdom of priests, which means that they will be God's representatives to the rest of the world. When people look at them, they will see what the real God is like. So God tells his people to build this ark and then place it in a sanctuary, which we know as the tabernacle. And it was to be put in a special room that was curtained off. And on this curtain was embroidered into it pictures of cherubim, two cherubim. And this ark, it was to reside in this most holy place because it was God's throne. God's Shekinah glory, his presence and his powerful self, it would come and it would reside right over here between the cherubim on the mercy seat. This was a picture of the Garden of Eden where heaven and earth were meeting and touching. But just like the Garden of Eden where sinful man cannot dwell in the presence of a holy God, 
Man cannot enter here, and we see that with the two cherubim that are blocking the way on the curtain. So God has to make a plan, and what he does is he takes a portion of those Israelites, and he takes the tribe of Levi, and he designates them as his priest. And so once a year, the high priest can enter into the most holy place, and he can be a representative of the people to God. But before he can enter and atone for sin, he has to first make sacrifices. He has to make a sacrifice for the people, and he has to make a sacrifice for himself. There needed to be a substitution. Sin is so costly. It is so costly, and justice demands that, it would, that the price be paid. And so what they would do is they would lay their hands on an animal, and it would temporarily transfer their sin onto that animal, and then that animal would die in their place. And this really is all a picture of what Christ does for us, because Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice, and he dies in our place. He takes our sins on us, and he dies in our place. And then not only does the high priest get to enter into God's presence, but now through Jesus, everyone who accepts him accepts him as Lord and Savior, we get to then go into God's presence, which is a remarkable and wonderful thing. So David, he wants this little peace where heaven and earth are meeting. He wants to be with God because he wants to bring this Ark of the Covenant into the heart of his nation because he wants to bring this covenant-making God into the hearts of his people. And so David sets off. He sets off for Bala, Now, the reason why um, David is going to Bala to get the ark, in case you don't know, um, during the time of the judges, God allowed the ark of the covenant to be captured by the Philistines. Once the Philistines get it in their borders, they are realizing that they don't want it anymore because it is wreaking havoc on their country. Um, Wherever the ark goes, plague breaks out, tumors are growing on people, and so they devise a plan. They get a cart and they placed the Ark of the Lord, or Ark of, Ark of God, Ark of the Covenant. Those are all different names for it. They place it on this ox cart. And they hitched the ox cart up to two oxen, or two female cows, who had just given birth. And they surmise that if these cows go against their natural instinct, if they go against their maternal instinct, and they leave their babies, and they walk away from them into the borders of Israel, then the God God of uh, Israel is real, that he is real. And that's exactly what they do. And so God directs this cart into the borders of Israel. And when they get there, the people are really excited to see that the ark has returned. And so they take these cows and they sacrifice them. But then some men get curious and they go over and they think that they can lift open the lid and peer inside of the ark. They want to know what's in there. And 70 men die. And so then the people recoil away from the ark and they cart it off to the home of Abinadad and it remains in his house for 20 years. Some um, commentators say that it was even, it might've even been more like 70 years until David. David wants to get this ark because he sees its presence as life-giving. So we're just going to read here. David again brought together all the able young men of Israel, 30,000. He and all his men went to Bala and Judah to bring up from there the Ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim on the Ark. They set the Ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadad, which was on the hill. Uzzah, Ohio, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart with the Ark of God on it. And Ohio was walking in front of it. David and all of Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord with cassinets and harps and lyres and timbrels and sistrums and cymbals. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. Therefore God struck him down, and he died there beside the ark. Then David was angry because of the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah. Until this day, that place is called Pera Uzzah. David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How can the ark of the Lord 
ever come to me. He was not willing to take the ark to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Oben-Edom, the Gittite. For a moment, I want you to just imagine that you are in the crowds. Imagine the scene that you are with David. All of a sudden, the procession has stopped. You're looking to see what's going on. The music is starting to fade, and you think you see a body. And then all the cries of celebration are starting to cries of fear and panic, and you realize what's happened. David is horrified by this. He is angry, but even more so, he is afraid because it says in verse 10 that he was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him anymore. David no longer wants to be in God's presence. And if you are like me, this moment is probably heavy for you, and it's probably very sobering because a man has died. And now David who was a man who sought after God's heart, longed for God, doesn't want to be with him anymore. So what is happening? Um, At first blush, um, it's easy to say that Uzzah died because he was disobedient. Uzzah touched the ark. And we know that you're not supposed to touch the ark of God. It's holy. And David, we think maybe he died or he's alienated because of what happened to Uzzah, because Uzzah was treated harshly, David thinks, maybe by God. So what I would say is this. Sin is never simple. It is pervasive and it is layered. And I would argue that Uzzah's death is not, it is linked to his disobedience, but there is something much, much deeper going on. There is something much deeper in Uzzah's heart. And David, his alienation, that sense of distancing himself from God, I believe that it begins before he even puts one step in Bala. Um, Chronicles, 1 Chronicles 13 through 17, they retell this story that we are looking at here in 2 Samuel 6 and 7. And they um, give a more detailed account. And so that gives us a little bit more insight as to what is happening. So David, before he sets out to go and get the ark, it says that he inquires of all of his officials, um, a lot of them. He looks at his officers and he seeks their counsel. And there is nothing wrong with um, seeking out a friend's advice or advice of many people. But what's really interesting is that there is no mention of David inquiring of God. Not at all. David, there's no, he's not searching scripture. He's not praying. There's nothing there. And so this is really striking for David because it's a huge departure from David's character. Because up to this point, David's life, it has been just this surrender to God's will and seeking God's face, and there's no mention of that. And later on, um, it mentions that they did not inquire of God. And so David, he's actively seeking the advice of man over the counsel of God. And David, he is um, having a subtle shift here. And it's really subtle because there is a reliance on self from a reliance on God that David is starting to shift. And he is in danger because um, David is going to recover the ark in his own strength and in his own wisdom and really out of his own desire because he has never brought this before the Lord. And how can you know what God wants if you don't speak to him? And so um, David, I think, is in danger of getting little idols to root in his heart small little idols that are coming up and they're just barely there because ladies, if you love God and you want to spend time with God, you are probably not going to chase after a sin that is really glaring. But if you love God, then sin has to be subtle. It has to be tiny. It has to go unnoticed. It doesn't want to be dealt with. And so this is really subtle. Tim Keller, he has a wonderful book called Counterfeit Gods. He makes this quote. He says that we are bent to make idols and we can make them out of anything. 
and if we prefer our own wisdom to God's wisdom, our own desires to God's will, or our own reputation to God's honor, then we have set up idols in our hearts. And I think David is in danger. I think he's right on the edge of slipping into relating to God the way all the other foreign nations relate to God. In that the other foreign nations, when they, when they sought their gods, they were devoted and they did good things for their gods, but they did it in order to be blessed. They did it to um, get leverage and control over their gods. Theirs was a quid pro quo relationship. In essence, they would say, I've been devoted to you. I've been good to you. Now I expect you to be good to me. But David is forgetting that his God is not like that. His God cannot be approached based on the wisdom of man. And his God is holy. His God is set apart. His God cannot be controlled. Because do you see how David is transporting the ark? on an ox cart, just like the Philistines. God's rules for the ark were in place. He gave specific rules on how to carry the ark. And they were there to point people to God's character and aspects of his person. The ark was to be carried. It was to be covered and carried on the shoulders of the Levitical priest. This is indicative of how one would carry a king. His name, it says that his name was Yahweh of hosts. He was enthroned between the cherubim. That points to his kingship. A cart is how one transports an item. To make matters worse, Um, A lot of commentators believe that Uzzah and Ohio were not even Levitical priests. They didn't think um, they were Levites. And so this institution that God had set up as a way for man to get close to him, as a way for man to be with him, is not present. And yes, Uzzah was probably somewhat devoted. He was taking care of the ark for many years. But being familiar with God... It's not the same as being atoned for or being forgiven by God. And the ark makes it very clear. The only way mankind can approach it was through grace. A sacrifice had to be made on your behalf. Uh, Timothy Keller has a great quote. He says, you cannot go in to God's presence with your good works. There is a chasm that can only be bridged by an incredible, gracious sacrificial provision. Can you begin to see what's happening here? God has been disobeyed, but he has also been um, dethroned, treated as an object, and the very means by which man can be at peace with him is not here. God's rules for carrying the ark, they were a safeguard for humanity and they pointed to his holiness and they pointed to his kingship and they pointed to his grace and one by one they were being eroded by the very people God had designated to be a kingdom of priests. And this, this leaves the question, how can God's character and attributes ever be made known to any of the nations if they themselves cannot see it. So I hope you can begin to see that when Uzzah goes to reach out his hand to steady the ark, there is so much more happening here than what appears to be on the surface. Because our reflexes, they give us away. And so that's exactly what happens. Uzzah's reflexes give him away. They tell what's in our hearts. Uzzah thought that the ark falling to the ground, falling to the dirt, would defile it more than him touching it. (laughs) But the dirt is doing exactly what God intended it to do. We can't say that about mankind. Uzzah couldn't see his sin, and he couldn't see God's holiness. Tim Mackey, um, he is best best known for his work on the Bible Project. He has this beautiful illustration He says, God's holiness is like the sun. It is the source of life that sustains all things. But if you get too close or you try to touch it, 
you are going to die because of, because of its overpowering goodness and glory. And we are told that Uzzah is struck down on the threshing floor. And over and over again in the Bible, um, the threshing floor is very symbolic for this separation of good and evil. And it's also linked to idolatry. And so um, Uzzah, there is this clear distinction that God is saying, I'm holy, mankind is evil. And what's Uzzah's idolatry? Well, Uzzah thought he could approach God based on his good works, that he could be his own savior. And he didn't realize how very lethal that type of thinking was. But God does not give up on his people because he is so committed. He is so committed to blessing the world through them that he will not allow them to go on in this self-destructive pattern. His love is loyal and he will not give up on them. Over and over again, what you are going to see is that the spiritual health of the nation is linked to the spiritual health of the king. And so God is going to use this very painful experience to wake David up to whatever tiny little bit of idols that might be starting to take hold in his heart. David's world right now is crashing down on him. All his efforts have failed. His wisdom has failed, and even more so, he has failed his people. And David, he has placed his hopes of being united to God on his efforts. All of his striving is not enough. And so David, in this moment, he is seeing God's holiness, and he is realizing that man is incapable of bridging that gap. God's holiness is greater than David ever imagined, which means the divide between him and God is also greater than he ever imagined. And now he doesn't know. He doesn't know how he can be in God's presence anymore. And what's happening to David is his thinking is getting muddled and it's getting confused because, ladies, that's what sin does. That's what little idols do. They confuse our thinking and they muddle it. Because David is forgetting that the ark is not just a picture of God's holiness. But he can't see it. He can't see God fully. And he can't see God clearly. Timothy Keller says that idolatry, it distorts our feelings. Just as idols are good things turned into ultimate things, so the desires they generate become paralyzing and overwhelming Idols generate false beliefs, such as, if I cannot achieve X, then my life won't be valid. Or since I have lost or failed Y, now I can never begin forgiven. These beliefs, they magnify ordinary disappointments and failures into life-shattering experiences. And this is where David is at. But... And if this is where you are at, I want you to hear this. David's story, it doesn't end here. It doesn't end here because something happens in the next couple of verses that change David's course completely. It says, The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Oban Edom the Gittite for three months, and the Lord blessed him in his entire house. Now King David was told, The Lord has blessed the house of Oban Edom and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went to bring up the ark of the Lord from the house of Oban Edom. And David and the city went with rejoicing, and those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps. He sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might, while he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sounds of trumpets. So what's happened? How does this take David from a place of alienation to a place of rejoicing? Well, David is beginning to see. He's beginning to see that despite doing nothing, Oban Edom and his entire household are being blessed, which begs the question, why? Because the ark is not just a picture of God's holiness. 
It's a symbol of his mercy because where God comes to meet us is on that mercy seat. God comes down to man in mercy. On his first attempt, David thought that he was doing something for God. But now on the second attempt, David sees that it's actually God who is doing something for him. David is encountering God. And he is realizing that, yes, there is this huge problematic divide. But God's ability to bridge that divide and God's desire to bridge that divide is even greater. Before, David felt like a failure and he felt like he wasn't loved and he felt like he was more wicked than he could ever even believe. But now David is saying he is more loved than he can ever imagine. He is more sought after than he could ever imagine. God does desire to be with man. Before, David was putting trust in his own abilities, but now David is saying that his trust needs to be in God's ability. And before, David was putting trust in his own goodness, but now he is saying that he can put his trust in God's goodness. And now David is quick to go and get the ark. And what we're seeing here is a new and transformed David because David now is so humble before the Lord. And now his obedience is actually an act of love because he sees the rules are protective and that they are highlighting God's grace and that his holiness is good, it's powerful, and it's life giving. There is blessing in Obed Edom's house. And that coming under his kingship, it means freedom. Because now um, the Levitical priests are carrying the ark. The, uh, the Chronicles count tells us that the Levitical priests are carrying the ark. And not only are they carrying it, but they are surrounded by other Levitical priests. And there is this clear picture now of how we approach God it is in place. It is based in grace. And not only that, they are playing trumpets before the ark. And so now we have this picture of them playing trumpets and they're all lifting the ark and all the priests are around it. And David doesn't have to have the responsibility of being king anymore because Yahweh is the king. He is being escorted by his people into his city. And David just gets to participate and he gets to rejoice. And David, he is so full of this that they take six steps. And David can't help himself but stop the parade and sacrifice. And they sacrifice, they offer up a bull and a fattened calf. And it says that they did this to thank God for helping them. It tells us that in the Chronicles account. David, the last time the, the procession halted was because Uzzah died. But this time, it's to give thanks to God. It's to worship him. And David, he knows. He knows how costly sin is. But because of that, he knows how deeply he is forgiven. And so now David is dancing. Now he's dancing. This is what makes David dance. He's forgiven and he is worshiping God. He has come under his kingship. And then when David gets to Jerusalem, we see this remarkably beautiful picture because even though David is a king, he has stripped off his royal robes and he is wearing a linen ephod, which is the clothing of a priest. And so we have this beautiful image of a king priest entering into Jerusalem. And David, he is um, just praising God with all his might. So any of that royal um, pride or pretense that was attached to him has just melted away. And now David, he doesn't care. He doesn't care if he is undignified in the eyes of man, if it means honoring God. And this is so new and it's so freeing because before David was seeking out the counsel of men and before David was feeling the weight of failing the men, but now David has been freed he has been freed from looking to men as his God. He is no longer beholden to their opinion. What matters most to David is what God thinks of him. And that drives out, that drives out what David was looking for, man's approval. It's driven out and it's replaced by God's approval. And that is really powerful. 
And then David, he offers up um, burnt offerings and he offers up these um, fellowship offerings once the ark has been put in the tent. And again, it's this beautiful picture because David is um, asking for, for forgiveness for sins. And then David is also praising God for a relationship restored. And that is just a beautiful, beautiful picture of this king priest. And in this moment, David is being what God intended him to be. A ruler who is like a priest. This king priest with all the other nations can see what God is truly like. And ladies, God works the same way for us. Because there are going to be times in our lives when God does things that we don't understand. And there are going to be times in our life where we feel really deep pain. But God isn't going to waste that pain. He's going to use it. C.S. Lewis says that pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but he shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. And it is true that God loves you where you're at. But it is also true that God loves you so much that he will not leave you there. God will not leave you in self-destructive behavior. He loves you too much. When one of my sons was really young, um, he, my husband and I had a really challenging time disciplining him because any time we would try to correct him, he would just start to self-hate. We would hear him upstairs, and he would say, I don't want to live anymore. I'm such a horrible person. I'm such a bad person. And it was so destructive for his little heart. And thankfully, he was a very advanced reader. And so um, one day when I heard him doing this, I pulled him aside, and I said, listen, sweetheart, I want you to go upstairs, and I want you to pray. And I want you to ask God to talk to you and show you about this behavior. And then I want you to open your Bible, and I want you to read. And then when you're done, I want you to come down and tell me what God has taught you. So he took his little self upstairs, and he opened his Bible, and he began to read. And then he came down, and he said, Mommy, I read a passage about where Saul was persecuting God. And God said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Mommy, I realize that I have the Holy Spirit. And when I persecute myself on persecuting God. And so ladies, when we allow sin to come into our hearts and cloud us, God wants to free us from that because it's so destructive, because we are meant to bear his image and it breaks his heart. It breaks his heart when he sees you stuck in sin especially sin that is repeating over and over again. He wants you to have freedom. He wants you to be free because he takes it so personally. He loves you, and he is a God who identifies with you, and he wants to free you. He wants to free you from those destructive behaviors. And so um, one of the hardest things that can happen is... um, What is the secret to change? Well, the secret to change is identifying. It's identifying and it's dismantling these counterfeit gods in our hearts. Because at the root of every sin is this form of idolatry. It's where we love something else more than God. And so finding idols, they can be really difficult. It's one of the hardest steps in the battle is how do we find idols, especially, especially if you are close to God, Because, like I said before, they don't want to be known. They want to go unnoticed. They want to go in and steal our joy little by little. They don't want to be ripped out. And so the best way not to be ripped out is not to be identified. And so Tim Keller, he gives some really practical ways at which we can look at and identify idols in our hearts. And one of the ways, he says, is look at what captivates your daydreams. Where do your um, thoughts go when nothing else is demanding your attention? Because that's, that's a good indicator of what might be an idol for you. And then another um, great one is look at where you spend your money. Matthew 6, 21 says, where your treasure is, there is your heart also. So where do you spend your money? 
Look at your most uncontrollable and painful emotions, especially those that never seem to lift or that drive you to do things that you know aren't right. And then lastly, he says to look at your response when you ask God for something and God tells you no. And if you are disappointed and if you are sad, but yet you know that you can move on from there and that your world is not ending, then that is okay. That's a normal human behavior. However, if you respond with just explosive anger, or if you're in deep despair, then that might be a really good indicator of what the real God is that you are serving. And it is critical, ladies, that when you identify um, this idol, that you ask God to rip it out, you ask him to replace it with himself. Because the only way, I love this quote, the only way to dispose the heart of an old affection is by the expulsive power of a new one. You have to make God your greatest love. And if you have a hard time making God your greatest love, then take some time to just meditate on him on his goodness and all the ways that God has been there for you. And you can start by just thinking about what it cost him to love you. It cost him his life. And what really is moving for me is also just what it cost him to be able to identify with me. When, I'm, when I feel like I've been treated unjustly, you know what, so has he. <laughs> when I feel like, oh, I'm being tempted by a sin, you know what? So is he. Ladies, he is a God that identifies with us. It is one of the most beautiful things about him is that he doesn't ask of us what he wasn't willing to do. He, he, he experiences everything you experience. You can go to him. You can go to him. He will understand and he will walk with you. In the next chapter, we get to see how far David has come. We get to see a lot of things. But one of the things I want to point out is how far David has come. Because David is still really passionate about making Jerusalem um, like the official place of worship. He's really passionate. He has the Ark of the Covenant there, but he wants it to be permanent. And so he wants to go and build a house for God. And um, he kind of floats it by Nathan, which is really progress for David because Nathan is God's prophet. And so he is to speak the very words of God. Um, Nathan, unfortunately, speaks a little too quickly. And so he has to come back to David and say, "Um, about that, David, yeah, you're not the one God has chosen to build him a house. And ladies, um, when we are passionate about something, hearing that word, no, is very painful, and it's very hard to hear. And I don't think David was probably more passionate about many things than this. He really, really wanted to do this for the Lord, and the Lord told him no, and David's response isn't anger, it isn't throwing, you know, Nathan out. He just takes it and listens. And David's will is just submitting to the Father's, even when it hurts. Even when it hurts him, he submits to the Father's will. Do you know why? Because David loves God more. He loves God more. And in this moment, the small little picture right here, David is the ideal king for Israel. And so God tells David, he flips the script. Um, and this is something that I really want you to also remember because there are times when God tells us no. And it's God's not rejecting David. It's not a rejection of David. When God tells you no, it's not a rejection of you. It's just that he has a different plan. And in this case, an even better one. It's something David couldn't even wrap his mind around. It was so amazing. Because God tells David, David, um, you're not going to build a house for me, but I'm going to build a house for you. David, I'm going to give you a dynasty. So David, when you die... I am going to put your son, your own flesh and blood on the throne. And that is something new for Israel. They've never had a father and then be succeeded by his son. 
So this is new and it's exciting. And then he tells him, David, not only that, but when your son sins, and when his son sins, and when your lion sins, my love will never depart from them. I will never take my love away from them. And then he tells them this, that your throne and this kingdom are going to be established forever, forever. And essentially God is telling him that neither death, sin, nor time will break his commitment. God is that gracious. None of those things will break God's commitment. And ladies, this promise is known as the divinic covenant. And this idea of a kingdom has long been anticipated. In Genesis chapter (laughs) 1, Genesis chapter 1, um, verses 26 through 29, it says, God makes mankind in his image and in his likeness so that they could rule. Rule over the earth. God was the supreme king, but mankind were his vassal kings that were to care for and cultivate the earth, his world, and they were to carry out his will on earth as it is in heaven Part of man ruling was carrying out God's will, which is remarkable. But mankind, they rebel against God in the garden. And they say, not your will be done, my will be done. They dethrone him and they put themselves on the throne and they say, I will determine what's right and wrong for myself and enter into the kingdom of man. And it is ugly, and it is cruel, and it is oppressive. But God, he loves mankind so much that he carves out Abraham, and he makes a nation. And so he tells Abraham and Sarah, from you, kings are going to come. And then later on, he tells Abraham's descendant, Jacob, I mean, um, yeah, Jacob. He says, Jacob, um, he gives him a prophecy, sorry. He gives Jacob a prophecy, and Jacob prophesies over his son Judah. He says, Judah, um, you are going to have the scepter and the ruler's staff, and it is never going to be taken from you until, until the one whom it belongs to comes and claims it, and to the one whom all the nations are going to honor. So Jacob, he prophesies over his son Judah. And that's remarkable because we know who that's talking about. And then in Deuteronomy 17, it says, um, Moses, he gives the instructions to the people that when they get a king, this is what the king is to look like. He is to be a king that is humble, who doesn't acquire wealth or possessions, but seeks God and longs to know God. And he actually takes a scroll and he is to write the law on the scroll and roll up the scroll and keep it with him all the days of his life. That is how in love with God's law and God he is to be. And mankind, they don't do a great job keeping these um, rules. The Abrahamic covenant was was a, a way of promising a realm and a people for the kingdom, and that through them the nations would be blessed. The Mosaic covenant was the law of the kingdom that God gave that would reflect God's character. And David now was um, providing the human for to be the king of this kingdom. And so one day um, his offspring would um, extend God's kingdom of peace and blessing over all the nations. And so Jesus Um, He is the one who fulfills all of these covenants because Jesus, he is a descendant of Abraham. He is the faithful Israelite who keeps the law perfectly. He never sins. And he is from the line of David. And he is going to be the one who reigns over the world and brings healing and blessing because hundreds of years later, Jesus would enter into Jerusalem and there would be crowds that were cheering. And he would bear this image of a king priest because he would be given a crown, but it wouldn't be of gold. It would be of thorns. And he was going to be exalted and lifted up, but it wouldn't be to a throne. It would be to a cross. And he was going to make a sacrifice. 
that would atone for the sins of all mankind and that would restore them into fellowship with God. But that offering he was going to make was going to be himself. And by his death, he ushers in this kingdom of God that is not built out of might or out of power or out of strength, but out of sacrificial love and out of grace. And he invites us into it because Jesus didn't stay in the grave. He was victorious. He overcame death. He overcame death itself. And then he takes us and he says, I promise you eternal life. If you put your trust and hope in me, if you make me your savior and your king, you will have eternal life. And essentially he is saying that um, sin and death and time will not keep me from you, and it will not keep you from me. And ladies, he conforms us. He invites us into this kingdom. And when we allow him to get into the pain of our lives, when we allow him to take reign over it and to start to refine our thoughts and shape our character, guess what? We start looking like him and we become what we were intended to be in Genesis 1, image bearers, to bear his image. And then together, collectively, as a people, we become this kingdom of priests that points the rest of the world to what God is supposed to look like. It's amazing and it's groundbreaking. In 1 Peter 2.9, it says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Ladies, we are to go out into this world by our actions and by our words and tell people the good news because it's good news to have a kingdom that looks so different from the kingdom of man. It's good news. And so, ladies, one day he is going to come back and he will return and he will make all things new and he will usher in his kingdom and we will get to dwell with him face to face. We will see him. And I just want to leave you with this thought. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with him. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. These things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new, for I am trustworthy and true. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word, and I thank you um, that you are a God of loyal, relentless love that loves your creation so much that you yourself gave your life for it. Abba, help us to see those things in our lives that are keeping us from bearing your image, that are keeping us from having freedom, Lord, and things that are just keeping us um, just in a spiral of self-hurt. Abba, I pray that you would just um, give us boldness, Lord, to come to you and come to you with love and joy and that you would just pull out those things, Lord Jesus. And I'd praise you, Father, because you are good and you are gracious to do that which you accomplished. I pray that you would be with these women and that you would just bless their day. In Jesus' name, amen.